Good morning, church. I know we're few, but we're mighty. I know it's not a great day out, but it's a great day to praise the Lord. All right. Amen. I'm trading my soul. with a litany that we will recite together uh, responsibly. O come, let us worship the Lord and consider what wondrous things God has done. O come, let us worship the Lord and consider what wondrous things God has done. O 
O come, let us worship the Lord and consider what wondrous things God has done. O come, let us worship the Lord, for God has done wondrous things. Let us continue in song. by many thousands of people who've gathered in worship. We believe that the way we treat one another is the fullest expression of how we live out our faith. We find our approach to God through the life and teachings of Jesus Christ, who is our model for living. And we recognize the faithfulness of other paths, which may also lead people to an experience of God. We stand in God's grace, and we live that grace in our attitudes and actions toward one another. We understand the church as a community of people who together make up the body of Christ as we strive to serve the spiritual, emotional, and physical needs of others. We are inclusive as Christ was and welcome all people seeking a closer relationship with God. We believe that the questions are as important as the answers, 
that living the mystery is a more sacred position than church tradition and doctrine. And we strive to love all, serve all, in Jesus' name, as we proclaim our mystery of faith, that Christ died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. The congregation may be seated, and the children of uh, the church are invited to come on up for the children's message. You sit here and you, you, you can still see mom, okay? You want to sit right here? You want to step up? I'll give you a hand. Are you okay right there? I think we're okay right there. It's all right. All right, for those of you who are watching online, I just wanted to remind you that for privacy reasons, we do not show the children's time. You can hear us, but you cannot see us, and that is intentional. Uh, so I have a question for you. I've asked you before what your favorite food was. Y'all remember me asking you about your favorite food? Yeah? Maybe you weren't here that Sunday. Today, I want to ask you a question. I want to know what is your least favorite food? What is the thing you do not want to eat? Anybody? Broccoli? How about you, Liam? Hamburgers and pizza? You don't like that kind of junk food. Yeah. How about you? What's your... Spinach? You don't like spinach? Is there some food that you go, ooh, I don't want to eat that? Sushi? Okay. Jack, how about you? Jack, is there is there a type of food that you don't like to eat? Tomatoes? I know Violet has this real thing about green beans, right? Well, we know Violet does not like green beans. Uh, there's always something that we might not like. Um, I was not a big fan of Brussels sprouts or asparagus when I was growing up because my mom never made them. But when I became an adult and I started eating them, I was like, I missed this my whole life. It's very good. But there's one thing I still do not eat. I do not eat peppers. I don't eat bell peppers. I don't eat hot peppers. I don't eat any of that kind of stuff. Everybody knows I hate yeah, you all know I hate pickles, right? You know I don't like pickles, which is why when somebody says, we're going to bring you over some food, we'll make sure there's pickles in it. I'm like, thanks. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't like pickles. So guess what happens if I go to a restaurant with friends or I go to a dinner and on the table is something that has peppers in it? Do you know what I do? I go, yuck, that's so gross. Why would you serve that? Oh, I could go to a different table and eat. I could just leave the food there. I could go to a different table. You've got all the answers. I love that. Come on up, kids. Come on up. Um, yeah, I don't think I can do that. So if, if your mom puts something on your plate that you don't want to eat, Jack, what do you do? Do you just not eat it or do you say, ooh, yuck? You just don't eat it? Do you ever say, ooh, yuck, to something that you don't want to eat? Sometimes, yeah. You can see yourself, can't you? Yeah. What do you do? You hate olives. So do you say just don't put olives in my martini? Huh? No. Oh, okay, not that. All right, sorry, sorry. Okay, so here's what I do. What I do is I just ignore it, right? And so I'll take a little bit that might have a little peppers on the side, and I'll pick around it. Uh, or sometimes I just say, oh, I'm so full. I'm so full. Uh, and I won't eat it. When I was growing up, Whenever we would see something and we would not want to eat it, my dad said this, don't spit on the jello, girls. And we were like, what? And what he was saying is, if you don't like something, you can't, you can't make it messed up. You can't, I don't know where he got it. I don't know if it was my dad's weird brain that came up with this thing, or it was something he learned. But he would say, don't spit on the jello. Cindy's family always says, don't yuck on my yum much more understandable, right? If I had started with don't yuck on my yum, you would have liked it better, right? So one of the things that we're going to talk about today is that sometimes things happen and we're not really happy about them. Sometimes people do things uh, that make us not completely happy. And sometimes we, we have to change our behavior. We have to start doing something different. 
Oh, you said you were going to throw up if they gave you spinach? Yeah. That would stop me from giving you spinach, for sure. So what I want you to think about today is what happens when something goes on and you're not really happy about it. I think we have to be as polite and caring as we can be and say, oh, I'm so glad you made supper tonight. I'm really excited about the meat or the potatoes and just compliment those things and don't say anything about the stuff we don't like. As we're growing up, guess what? We all have to do things we might not necessarily like to do, but we do them because we're growing up and we're trying to make the right decisions. So here's what I want you to do. I want you, when somebody offers you something you don't like, to just say, oh, no, thank you, right? Oh, no, thank you. Or, oh, I really appreciate that, but I'm not hungry right now. And just be kind and compassionate about it. And you can go back to your room and go, ew, ew, but nobody knows, right? Just you, you and God, and me, I'll know. Right? God tells me. I get a... No, I'm kidding. Listen, I want you guys to have a great time today. We have a couple of Sunday school teachers who are not here. So if you are first grade through sixth grade, we're going to stay in uh, the sanctuary right now. But if you are uh, kindergarten and lower, you can go back to have Sunday school right now, okay? All right. You guys have a great day. Thank you. All right, and let us continue in song. Please stand.
may be seated. As always, we thank our praise band. They are growing. They got new members. They got new stuff going on, new songs. Uh, thank you all. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. Uh, today we're going to be reading from the Gospel of John. John is uh, not the, uh, a gospel that we read throughout any season. We go through the lectionary. There are four gospels. And one year we do Matthew, Mark, Luke, each one a separate year. John does not currently have John's own year. Uh, there are some who would like to do that, but it has not happened as of yet. Uh, and uh, we usually read John on festivals, uh, on special holidays, uh, and occasions like this. Uh, today we're going to read a story that I think is fairly common, uh, and that is the story of the wedding at Cana uh, from the Gospel of John, the second chapter, verses 1 through 11. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And he said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now, standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water. And the servants filled them up to the brim. He said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, Though the servants knew who had drawn the water knew, the servants, excuse me, who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone saves, uh, serves the good wine first and then the inferior wine after everyone has become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Let us pray. Holy God, bless the reading and the hearing of this, your holy word, but especially of God. Bless its doing. Amen. How you grew up in the Lutheran church? Raise your hand if you grew up in the Lutheran church. All right? Uh, put your hands down. How many of you grew up in the Roman Catholic Church? Roman Catholic Church, all right? Uh, how many of you grew up Baptist, uh, non-denominational, Pentecostal, Methodist, Episcopalian, Presbyterian? Some people are putting up more than one hand. Oh, yeah, me too. I grew up in the United Methodist Church. Uh, about uh, four years ago, uh, I moved to the UCC church, and I both teach and pastor at ELCA congregation, so I'm sort of a denominational mutt in some ways. Uh, but one of the realities is that my first understanding of church, my first understanding of theology, my first understanding of, of who God was and how God acted in the world came out of that Methodist tradition. Uh, my dad's a Methodist pastor. We have Methodist pastors like six generations back. Uh, and so we're, we're very Methodist. Uh, I, I say now that I'm sort of a, a, a grace-filled a Wesleyan a denominational mutt. Uh, but it formed me, right? It formed me in some important ways. Uh, in the United Methodist Church, we started in this nation uh, basically with a, a clergy shortage. And what they did is they set up these circuits, and we had Methodist circuit riders who would ride around the countryside on a horse, and they would have uh, their robe, they would have uh, communion elements uh, potentially, but a lot of times they would wait and get those elements there. Uh, they would have a change of clothes maybe, uh, and they would travel from one church to the next. So they had a 12-week circuit. So Methodist churches only had communion once a quarter. That's all they could do because they could not have communion if the circuit rider was not there. You had to be ordained in our denomination to serve communion. That's true in a lot of different denominations as well. And one of the things that was always sort of telling to me is that we always had a loaf. We always had a loaf bread that we tore, and we always had Welch's grape juice. Uh, never had wine. I had never had wine in a worship service until uh, I uh, was in beyond college. I, I was uh, uh, in my 20s, late 20s or 30s when I went to worship with another uh, friend of mine, and they served wine at communion, and that was the only option. 
Uh, so let me just go back for a minute. I want to tell you a little bit about how Methodism sort of developed their understanding of communion. There were two sort of uh, issues that sort of began to, to form around the same time period. Uh, one of those was the women's rights movement, late 1800s, early 1900s. The other thing that sort of began around the same time was this temperance movement, right? Uh, this uh, move to have prohibition passed. Uh, and one of the interesting things about both of those is that they were very rooted in congregations, in denominations. Women who uh, were Christian followers of Jesus also were part of the, the move for women's rights and the women's vote. Uh, many women in different denominations became part of what was called the women's uh, Christian temperance movement, thank you, sorry, uh, the women Christians temperance movement. Uh, and this started uh, with a lot of Methodist women. Uh, and so uh, they began to teach and to tell all of their constituents, all of their families, that they should never have wine. Well, in the early days of the Methodist church, that's all that was really available. And as the temperance movement began to come uh, into force, there were a lot of, of struggles with how we do communion. If, we, if we're going to have, pro, you know, there's going to be a prohibition against wine, how do we have communion? And uh, what they did is they decided that they uh, would try not to let their grapes ferment. Because once they ferment, it becomes wine. So they would, throughout the week, like late in the week, they would smash like a pound of grapes uh, and raisin pulp into a liquid. They would pour it into a vessel, and at room temperature, they had to be they had not much time because at room temperature, it would ferment pretty quickly. Uh, so they were constantly trying to play this game with, is it wine, is it grape, is it wine, is it grape? Uh, and uh, there were a lot of churches who just, they didn't have access to wine. Uh, they didn't have access to grapes. They didn't have access to the materials to try to do this. So when many churches in the Methodist Church started serving water with communion, in order to sort of uh, live into the temperance movement, the holiness movement, uh, they would just have water and bread. Uh, a lot of people felt like that wasn't real communion. Uh, and so there was a, a dentist in the 1880s, uh, a dentist named Thomas Welch. Uh, and Thomas Welch liked to, he had a, a lab, and he would work on things like, uh, you know, pain reliever, mouthwashes, all these other kind of stuff in his lab. So he decided, uh, after he went to communion with his brother one day, and his brother, who was a recovering alcoholic, couldn't receive communion because that particular church only had wine, he decided to create something new. So he created unfermented grape juice. We all know it today as Welch's grape juice. He was Methodist, his brother was Methodist, and it was all a part of that temperance movement, that move to try to, uh, to make things, uh, you know, better, healthier, all that kind of stuff, uh, and to really get rid of evil alcohol, which is what they thought at that time period. And one of the reasons they thought this was because of the women's Christian temperance movement. They thought alcohol was evil. Right? So this was this group of, of very devoted, devout uh, uh, activist kind of women who said, we're going to get rid of the evil of alcohol in our time. And several of them uh, were all across the country. There were some big pockets of temperance movement folks in like Kansas, Missouri, Texas, places like that in the, in the Midwest. Uh, and one of the big names of the temperance movement was a woman named... Carrie Nation. I hope that one of you might know. You haven't heard of Carrie Nation? All right, a few of you have. Let me tell you the story of Carrie Nation. Carrie Nation was born in a Disciples of Christ home. And so was, she was born with no alcohol, no smoking, no drugs, no dancing, uh, and no going with anybody who does, right? I mean, it was a very strict upbringing. So she brought up in the Disciples of Christ. She later became a Methodist. Uh, her first husband was an alcoholic. And he was a mean alcoholic. Uh, he was physically and emotionally abusive to not only her, but their young son, who was born as a part of that first marriage. She left him divorced after a few years uh, and eventually married a man who pastored a couple of churches. He was also an attorney. Uh, and Carrie Nation began to see that through the women's Christian temperance movement, she had this vision she received a vision from God that she was supposed to destroy bars and alcohol so that people could not partake of the evil of alcohol. 
And so Carrie Nation, the first thing she started doing is she would go in bars and she'd go in these pub places and she would preach at the top of her lungs and she would try to get the men and occasionally women out of there saying alcohol is evil, alcohol is evil, you've got to repent, you've got to repent. Uh, and people ignored her. Uh, you know, she's a woman screaming, they'd, you know, get her out eventually. So then she decided she was going to have to be more proactive, right? Uh, and so somebody gave her a hatchet. I would not have given this woman a hatchet. I'm just telling you right now. A woman who believes in the evil of alcohol and bars gets a hatchet. And guess what she did? She chopped up the alcohol. That's right. So you answered that one. All right. Uh, the other one, you left me hanging. Uh, so she goes into these bars and pubs. She takes this hatchet, and she starts banging. She's breaking glasses. She's breaking bottles of whiskey. She's breaking, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the beer taps. If they were there, I don't know, whatever. She was breaking open the cask of alcohol and everything. I mean, she is destroying the place. Why, at the same time, alcohol is evil. Alcohol is evil, right? Uh, and she's busting all this stuff up. And her purpose was to try to get people to see the evil of alcohol by destroying their businesses and driving away people who could probably go somewhere else and get alcohol. Uh, but she was convicted. She believed to the core of her being that she needed to get rid of alcohol. Now, what happened to her over the next few uh, years uh, and, and decades is she was arrested over 30 times for uh, trespassing, for uh, uh, breaking the peace, uh, for public dis uh, dis display of uh, violence, uh, for uh, breaking uh, items. 30 different times she was arrested. She continued speaking, doing speaking gigs, talking about the evils of alcohol throughout the entire life. And it was during her life, instead of her ministry and, uh, ministry and some of the other women's Christian temperance movement folks, who got the, the amendment for prohibition to be passed. And some of those same women were women who worked on the Get the Vote women's rights uh, movement and got the 19th Amendment, which gave uh, uh, women the right to vote. And so there was some phenomenal stuff that was going on, all sort of there at the same time. But it had ripple effects, right? It had huge ripple effects. What happens when you have an entire group of people say, if you're an alcoholic, that's bad, you cannot get, have anything to do with alcohol, you cannot even serve it in your homes, you should not have a single drop of it your entire life, it begins to put a stigma, right, on people who do use alcohol, even if they use it very little. What happened was you began to get this, uh, this, this divide between those who believed in the temperance movement, that that was a part of our Christian and holy life, and others who thought that that was a misreading, that even Jesus had wine, right? Even Jesus used wine and made wine at, we at weddings. So I was raised in a home uh, of, uh, of teetotalers, of absolute teetotalers. My grandparents never drank. My parents never drank. Uh, although there was that one sip of a fuzzy navel, somebody uh, sort of tricked my mother into trying one time, but she still professes because we gave her absolution uh, that she has never had a drop of alcohol past her lips. My dad, uh, he literally has never had alcohol past his lips. Uh, so one of the things that happens when you, you live that way is that it just be, sort of becomes a part of your life. Some people uh, go to college, they start drinking, uh, they start drinking, uh, and they figure out ways that this is healthy and unhealthy for them, and they go back to not drinking alcohol. I, I don't have any alcohol. I haven't really had alcohol since I was in college. That's my choice, Right. I don't, if I go, if we go out with people, if we're at someone's home and they say, do you mind if we drink? I say, absolutely not. It doesn't bother me. I made the choice for me. But it does become problematic sometimes. When I first started teaching at uh, the Philadelphia Lutheran Seminary, uh, I went into uh, the uh, Eucharist on Wednesday with the Eucharist, uh, and they had one cup. And so I went up to get communion. They tore off some bread and put it in my hand. Uh, and I sort of moved over to, the, to the, the cup station. And I said, is that juice or wine? And they said, wine. And uh, at that point, I, I really had not encountered that very often. I tried it one other time. So I just took the bread. I didn't dip it. Uh, in many traditions, it's, you know, if you, re you receive all of God's grace through one, both, uh, or all of the, uh, the elements. And uh, I just, I kept walking. And I went back to my office after that, and I thought, you know, I can't be the only person 
that doesn't want to take alcohol as part of communion. So I went to the dean at the time, and uh, uh, who was the dean of the chapel at the time, and I asked him if we could have two cups from now on, one that's uh, grape juice and one uh, that is wine. And he said, well, you know, I don't think anyone's asked me that before. I think we can do that. And so they started having two cups, wine and juice. And the next week when they had that, and I came forward and used the juice cup to dip my bread in, I went to sit down, and uh, three people came up to me after church and said, you were the, you were the, the one last week who didn't receive communion. I said, yeah. They said, Did, are you the one that asked for this? And I said, yeah. All three of them, recovering alcoholics, or they had grown up in houses of alcohol. And what I learned that then, and what we continue to try to do today, even in this congregation, is that we invite folks to come no matter who they are, no matter what they want to receive communion from, that we want to never be a barrier to somebody participating in the sacrament of communion. So why do I tell these stories around a miracle, a sign that Jesus performed? Well, I think it's an important sign. One, because it's the very first sign of Jesus showing his miraculous capability. And two, because Jesus' mom, she is amazing. She is awesome. She is a powerful chick, right? She's at the party. This is a three-day wedding party. All the wine is gone. And she looks at Jesus. She's like, hey, come on. Come in here. Come here. I need something. He comes in, and she's like, they run out of wine. And he looks at her like, what's that to me? Why is it bothering you? And then she does not respond to him. She looks at the servants and says, do whatever he tells you. What does that imply? He's going to do something because she told him to. This is the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ who just got told by his mama to get his act together. To do what I told you to do. At the age of about 30. You know that, moms and dads, it never runs out. No matter how your old your kids get, you can still put them in a place, right? So this moment, he says, all right, just fill up these jars. Fill up these jars that were there for sort of purification rites to, to, to bless and to, uh, to cleanse. Uh, and he says, fill those up. And then they, they put a cup in and they take it over to the wine steward, the guy who's running uh, the, the banquet, this three-day uh, festival feast of, uh, of, a, of a wedding. And he tastes it and he's like, wow, this is really flipping the table on wedding. Usually you put uh, your, your best wine out first, get people a little drunk, and then you put the cheap stuff, right? The bottom shelf stuff. That's what you put out next. And what the steward assumes is that the bridegroom has said, I, I want people to have the best wine near the end. I want to treat them as if they are absolutely so important. The bridegroom didn't do it. Jesus did. But see, the thing about this story and the thing about the other stories is it's not about the wine. It's about the transformation that takes place through the power of Jesus Christ. Right? It is about Jesus coming into moments, whether his mama told him to or he did it on his own. It is about Jesus walking into moments and transforming people and things and reality, healing people transforming their hearts and their lives, giving uh, blind people back their sight, helping people who are crippled to get up and walk again. It is about Jesus being able to transform anything into something valuable. This story often becomes about the wine, but I believe it's not about the wine. It is about the way we live our lives. It is about the reality of living faithful lives, knowing that as God comes into us, nourishes us, fills us, that we can live differently. That things won't be the same anymore. Carrie Nation and the Women's Christian Temperance Movement, they did a lot, but they also really made folks who were struggling with alcohol dependency and alcohol uh, addiction uh, pariahs during that time period. We still struggle with issues around addiction today. There, it's one of the, the illnesses that we do not talk about, not in public. We don't share those news, uh, those items with others. And there are people who are addicted to all kinds of stuff, food, porn, uh, wine, drugs, uh, all kinds of stuff, right? Addiction is difficult 
to deal with. So please, in no way do I want you to hear that you, you, you just ought not to be addicted or that I am demeaning or, or you know, debasing anyone who struggles uh, with kind of addiction. What I want you to understand is that I believe, I believe that the power of Jesus Christ, the power of God through the Holy Spirit and in the person of Jesus Christ can transform our lives can change us, can give us new hope after uh, illness, can give us new possibilities after birth, can give us new options when we struggle with health issues or whatever else is going on. I believe in the power of Jesus Christ. I believe in the power of prayer. That when we pray for one another, we are enabling us to feel the power of the Spirit to come into those who are facing procedures. That it can help us through our times of transition, lost jobs, lost loves, lost homes, whatever it is that we're going through, the death of someone we deeply love, and moving away from children, whatever these are. God is there with us to transform us into something new. God is that powerful. Do you, do you know that? Do you feel that? That is the truth, that as we pray and ask for prayers for those that we love, we are transformed into believers, into disciples. We get to say, God, help me with this, and I believe God helps us. It's not the magic trick, right? God's not up there with a magic wand, with, you know, or granting wishes. That's not how prayer works. What we pray for is God's presence in the midst of those times and give us comfort and grace and peace and to surround us with God's loving arms and hold us until things are better. I believe that to the core of my being, that God, through the life and lessons and death of Jesus Christ and through the power of the Holy Spirit, can transform our lives in profound and important ways and in little bitty simple ways. Because we believe, because we believe in the power of Jesus Christ, not just to turn water into wine, but to turn us into disciples, to turn us into followers of Jesus Christ, to turn us into the hands and feet and voice and eyes and ears of God, reaching out to each other and loving each other. God will transform us. God has transformed us. God is transforming us. Open your heart and receive that transformation. Amen. At this time in our worship, we will I uh, have our prayers uh, that uh, that we offer up to God, and as we get ready to pray, I invite you to share uh, your concerns, share your joys, and what we should be praying about this day. For all of those who will be facing surgery this week, yes. And their doctors, absolutely. Um, just a reminder, uh, before we go any farther, uh, this service is live stream. Hello, uh, live, live stream uh, worshipers. Uh, so please be careful as you uh, name people. Okay, for your mom. Right, those impacted by the government shut down. Mm. Right. For for the homeless who uh, who will be facing uh, a great uh, drop in temperature later today. Your, your friend from Dallas will be having surgery on Tuesday. So, Pastor Karen, yes. 
Yes, we are. We are praying. Yes, those who suffer from addiction and their families. Okay. Before I begin the prayers, I wanted to uh, let you all know uh, that at the end of uh, my time praying, we will uh, pray together the Lord's Prayer, and uh, the translations that we use will be available uh, for you on the screen for those of you who don't have it memorized. Um, actually, it's on uh, the bottom of the uh, 8 o'clock uh, service. Yes. Okay. Okay, for your sister and dad, who I noticed are not here today. And I would say for all those who are not here, and I know many are not here because of them. Let us gather our hearts and minds in prayer. Gracious, loving God. We come to you this day with hearts that are full. Hearts that are full of concerns for people that we know. And hearts full of concerns for people we don't know. And we ask that as we pray that you transform us. As you transform that water into wine. That we may know your abundance that we may know your care, that we may know your concern for everyday matters. We pray for all those who have received a terrible diagnosis, that they may feel you walking with them. We pray for medical caregivers, that you give them wisdom, and skill as they care for the people whom the people who are their patients. Gracious God, we pray for our nation, for those elected officials who are tasked with making important decisions that affect all of us. And especially we pray for those many, the hundreds of thousands, even millions who are affected by the government shutdown. That they may know your love and care. That they may know justice. That they may know hope. Gracious God, we pray for those who have left than we do. And gracious God, transform us into generous givers so that what we have, we share with those who do not have enough. Loving God, for all these things that we have mentioned aloud, for all these things that we hold in the silence of our hearts, we offer them up to you, confident that you answer prayer. And we end our prayer by praying the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. We give thanks to God for all that God has done, and now we show our thanks through the givings of our financial offerings. Spend 
Check, check. There we are. Hey, wow. No applause necessary, first of all, but thank you. Um, my name is Vinny Feliciano. For those of you who don't know me, some do apparently. Um, I'm just here because I have decided to become part of the transition team here at Glory Day. And uh, I've been tasked as the communicator. So <laughs> here I am to communicate to you that uh, we are having an event on Friday. Uh, Sunday, this uh, February 3rd, so uh, Super Bowl Sunday, um, I hope that's not a problem for any of you, no, nobody, I don't think so, anyway, <laughs> that said, we are still going to have an event, sort of in the spirit of that, we're going to have some hoagies, things of that nature, but the event is um, what we're calling um, a history event, it's 
Those of you who have been here for a while probably have had some of these before, but this one is not going to be what you're used to. It's going to be more of a conversation. Um, I'm new here. I joined with my lovely lady, Angela, and our beautiful little baby girl, Jessa. Some of you have seen her bopping around. Um, she's two, so she's not really great with attention. That's why she's not sitting here. But, uh, <clears throat> so, we're not very familiar with where this congregation comes from. Uh, many of you are. And this isn't comfortable for me, as conversation isn't really comfortable with everyone. And I just ask that uh, you join us on this, at this event. We're going to have uh, a single service, uh, and the event will be follow directly following that service. And uh, it's really about those that have been here a while, having conversations with those who haven't been here a while. And uh, it just brings me back to uh, our statement of faith that we are a community of people. And in, 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 my, in my community, I speak to my, my neighbors, and, and you are all my neighbors in this particular community. And I believe that we will be better served in the future if we all start to have conversations with one another. And this isn't an event trying to force people to talk. All we're doing is ask, we're asking people, as many as can, to give that time, an hour and a half, however long it takes, to just sit down and talk to one another. Um, we're going to provide, you know, um, some fun stuff for kids to do, and we'll have, uh, you know, a number of tables with just, you know, people sitting around, and we're all friendly here. We all know that none of us are going to bite anybody, right? None of you? All right, good. So those who are kind of bitey cannot come, but I'd like to... <laughs> I would personally like to see all of you there. If I can, if I can take what's in me and get up here in front of all of you and, and, and talk about how I love this church, I love this place, and I'm really excited for where we're going, we just need a little help to get there because we all want to bring this church and this congregation um, down the road together to where it needs to be. So I ask that February 3rd, following the 10 o'clock service, um, we all meet down there uh, for some food and for some conversation, and um, I hope you all can be there. Thanks. Okay. Well, that was the main announcement that I was going to make. Uh, we will have one service at 10 that day, then we'll go right down to the Christian Fellowship Hall. We'll be done by 1.30. So if you do go to a party, you should have plenty of time for that. Um, but uh, there are sign-ups in the back, and we'd like to uh, get a good number of how many folks will be there. One other announcement. Uh, we decided uh, around 9.05 today that uh, the office will be closed tomorrow. So um, don't... Don't expect us to be here, and uh, and don't you come here. So every everyone be safe. And I believe the preschool has already canceled uh, for tomorrow. So, uh, but we'll be ready to go uh, hopefully the rest of the week. At this time, uh, we would like to uh, invite the uh, newly elected and the continuing members of our church council uh, to come forward. Okay. Stay up there. Council music for a groovy council. The following people have been elected to positions of leadership. We give thanks for their willingness to serve. In baptism, we are welcomed into the body of Christ and sent to share in the mission of God. We rejoice now that these brothers and sisters will lead us in our common life and our mutual mission as a congregation. And uh, please uh, raise your hand as I say your name. Elected president is Jim Mulhern, uh, who uh, could not make it today. 
Vice President Stan Hamilton, Secretary Dave Barber, Treasurer Jenny Duffy, and also elected Doug Diamond, Ed Higgins, Peg Dabrowski, Bonnie McGill, Noreen Ostapovich, Nikovich. Okay. Heather Brining, Brinig, and uh, not here, Julie Hollihan and Fred Coppett. Hear this word from 1 Corinthians. There are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of services, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who activates uh, all of them in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. You have been elected to positions of leadership in, and trust in this congregation. You are to see that the words and deeds of this household of faith bear witness to God, who gathers us into one, together with the whole church. You are to seek to involve all members of this congregation in worship, learning, witness, service, and support, so that the mission of Christ is carried out in this congregation, in the wider church, in this community, and in the world. You are to be faithful in your specific area of serving, that the Spirit who empowers you may be glorified. You are to be examples of faith, active in love, fostering peace, harmony, and mutual understanding in this congregation. So, on behalf of your brothers and sisters in Christ, I ask you, will you accept and faithfully carry out the duties of the offices to which you have been elected? If so, answer, I will, and I ask God to help me. Now, it's not just their responsibility to lead the church, it's also your responsibility. And so I ask this of you, people of God, will you support these, your elected leaders, and will you share in the mutual ministry that Christ has given to all who are baptized? If you would, say, we will, and we ask God to help us. We will, and we ask God to help us. I now declare you installed as officers and council members of Gloria Day Congregation. Almighty God bless you and direct your days and your deeds in peace, that you may be faithful servants of Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. And now please stand for our sending song.
the day that you have been given to share the love of God and to be that transforming grace for someone around you. We often judge and blame each other. This is a moment where we can share and help folks feel the love that we have through the power of Jesus Christ. Transform your life. Transform others' lives by simply being the light. Today is the day. Amen.